The Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto lasted for 42 days and nights, beginning on the first Seder night, April 19, 1943, and ending a week before Shavuot. On that first night, all of the 40,000 Jews still left in the ghetto after the wholesale deportations and massacres went out to fight with weapons in their hands. On the 42nd day of the uprising, only one four-story building stood in the ghetto, as a fort from which fluttered the blue and white flag. It held out against the siege of the Nazis for eight hours. A fierce battle was fought for every floor of the building, separately, until, by midnight, it fell into the hands of the enemy. On the first Seder night, about midnight, German soldiers entered the ghetto and began throwing a cordon around a street from which they were to take away Jews, as in previous mass deportations. Formerly, the Germans had been accustomed to see Jews allow themselves to be led to slaughter without resistance, and a few dozen Nazi soldiers would be enough to carry out the deportation of thousands of Jews. But in Warsaw, in January 1943, the Jewish youth, mostly the Zionists, had already offered resistance, and many young Jews were killed. In order to overawe the Jews, the Nazis on the first night of the Passover arrived in six tanks. On reaching the main street, the Germans were met by an intense fusillade on all sides when the ghetto fighters opened fire on their tanks. The Nazis tried to flee, but they did not leave the ghetto alive and died in the flames of their own exploded tanks. It was then that the signal was given for the general uprising in the ghetto. Jewish houses were covered with proclamations and announcements of the uprising, in which the Jews will fight to the last drop of blood. The leaders went out into the streets and organized the fight. Every able-bodied man and woman was given weapons. The youth took up positions as sentinels on the streets. The larger houses were converted into forts, where large groups of fighters were concentrated. Every street was assigned a command and equipped with an arsenal. The fighters took up positions at the gates and windows of the buildings, with weapons in their hands. On the same night, trenches were dug in the streets for a battle with the enemy, and cellars were dug for shelter. The whole ghetto was made into one large fortress, and every house into a citadel. The children were charged with the grave task of acting as messengers among the fighters in different streets. They were also to bring food to the fighters. The children performed their part in the uprising at the peril of their lives, often under a rain of bullets. The old people, men and women, whose number in the ghetto was small, took over the work in the kitchens of preparing food for the fighters. Everything was fully organized on the first night. Not a minute was to be lost. The situation was very grave. It was known that soon a fierce struggle was to break out, for which it was necessary to be well prepared. Early in the morning, a special detachment of the fighters surrounded the German workshops, where Jews were employed, and the German arsenals. From these the Jews took the German uniforms which Jewish workers had been finishing or repairing. Thus, special squads were formed of fighters wearing German uniforms. Jews also entered German stores and seized large transports of foodstuffs, which they later distributed among the fighters in the ghetto. In the morning, the banners of revolt were hung out from the windows, the blue and white waving side by side with the Polish colors. The German and Lithuanian police, which used to escort the Jews to their daily labor, this time came to the ghetto, but did not leave it. The ghetto appeared deserted and desolate, and no human being was to be seen on the streets. Everyone was in some building ready for battle. The German soldiers who came in as usual to supervise the Jewish workers in the German workshops were not given a chance to leave. Soon, all Warsaw knew that the ghetto had proclaimed general uprising. At noon of the first day of Passover, the ghetto became a battlefield. Motorized military detachments, fully armed, appeared on the streets of Warsaw, headed for the gate of the ghetto, ten tanks leading the procession. A cordon was thrown around the non-Jewish section by German military forces who brought up machine guns. Many Poles were arrested, suspected of complicity in the preparations for the uprising in the ghetto and of planning to help the Jewish fighters. 
it was strictly forbidden to leave the non-Jewish section or to enter it. By noontime, the first shots were heard, and soon there was an enormous fusillade. Thick flames and smoke shot up from the ghetto, and fires broke out on both sides. The battle lasted far into the night. The Germans were now convinced that they were faced by an organized rebellion of the whole ghetto, which was ready to fight to the last drop of blood. They were fired on from every house in the ghetto they tried to approach. Late in the evening, the Germans abandoned tanks and machine guns, which had been put out of commission. The gates of the ghetto were blown up. The houses on the outskirts of the ghetto were burned down after being vacated by the fighters. In the evening, an order was issued by the leaders of the uprising to cease fire. The surviving Germans were surrounded and taken prisoner. In the evening, the battlefield was quiet, but flames and pillars of smoke were rising on all sides. The Jews were forbidden by their leaders to leave the houses and their defense positions. The guard was reinforced. That night, and the whole of the next day, passed without any clash. It was evident that the Germans were preparing to quell the uprising in the shortest possible time before it could cross the borders of the ghetto and before the central military authorities had learned of it. The third night was therefore spent by the Jews in preparing the defense. Detachments of Jews went out at night attacking the arsenals of the Gestapo, killing the guards and seizing the weapons. All night long, German trucks were loaded with ammunition and arms and taken into the ghetto. Whatever was left of the arsenals was blown up and burned down. The next day it became known throughout Warsaw that the German arsenals had been seized and blown up and that dozens of Gestapo agents had fallen into the hands of the Jews. Large transports of arms had secretly been brought into the ghetto some time earlier when the task of watching the ghetto was assigned to the Polish police, who cooperated in preparing for the uprising. Bombs, machine guns, and anti-tank cannon hidden under potatoes had been brought in on hundreds of trucks sent in by the secret Polish military organization. On the third night, the 6,000 young Jewish workers of the so-called small ghetto, who worked for the German army, joined the revolt. Their position in comparison with that of the 40,000 in the large ghetto was a privileged one, and they were in no danger of deportation. But when they learned of the uprising, they set fire to their small ghetto and went over to the fighters. The ensuing few days passed without clashes with the Germans. There was a conflict between the Gestapo and the German military authorities about the methods of quelling the uprising. The military authorities interpreted the revolt as directed against the Gestapo, because of its brutal treatment of the Jews, and rejected the Gestapo pleas for assistance, waiting for instructions from Berlin. The Gestapo, in the meantime, did not dare take any steps on its own. On the seventh night, the leaders of the uprising received a plea from the prisoners in the Pawiak jail. Save us and we will fight with you. The jail contained several thousand prisoners, mostly Jews and Poles, but also deserters from the German army. The Jewish leaders sent in the following reply. Every one of you is important to us. We will do everything to free you. On the next day, the eighth day of the uprising, 500 Jews dressed in German uniforms left the ghetto for the Pawiak jail, which was guarded by German soldiers. At night, the Jews opened fire. In the confusion of the dark, one could not tell which of the men in German uniform was a Jew and which was a German guard. The Jews entered the jail, bringing with them German uniforms for the prisoners and taking them out by groups disguised as German soldiers. By morning, they were all out of jail. All of them, including the German deserters from the front lines, went over to the fighters in the ghetto, organized in separate detachments. The liberation of the Pawiak prisoners encouraged the fighters in the ghetto and evoked enthusiasm among the Polish youth in Warsaw, as well as among those young Jews who were living outside the ghetto by virtue of their Aryan documents. Many young Poles volunteered to fight in the ghetto. Some partisans hiding in the woods also joined. Everyone was getting ready for a great battle. It became known that instructions had come from Berlin to destroy the ghetto completely. Large detachments of stormtroopers arrived from Galicia, and the German forces in Warsaw were increased. On the night before the great offensive for which the Germans were making intensive preparations, 
they issued an ultimatum to the Jews, that unless the struggle was discontinued and the German prisoners given up, the whole ghetto would be wiped out. The Jews replied that they were ready to give up the captured Germans on conditions that for each German prisoner, ten Jews were delivered by the Germans. There were a large number of German captives in the ghetto at the time. The next morning, the Germans opened the great battle. The ghetto was surrounded on all sides by tanks and cannon, which subjected it to enormous fire. The Germans were determined to bombard the ghetto until it surrendered. In this, however, they failed. The German tanks and cannon were showered by bullets and bombs from the houses and streets of the ghetto. The special suicide squad of the Jews broke through the lines and wrought ruin among the enemy. Disguised in German uniforms, they crawled under the German tanks and blew them up with hand grenades, losing their own lives in the fire which killed the Germans. Such was the havoc wrought by this method that the Germans were careful not to place groups of cannon behind tanks. Thus passed the day of the desperate battle. The Germans realized that they would not be able to vanquish the ghetto without heavy sacrifice. Hundreds of German soldiers lost their lives, and splinters of German tanks and guns were mingled with the debris of ruined houses at the gates of the ghetto. The German command then issued an order to have the whole ghetto blown up by incendiary bombs. A night of inferno then descended on the ghetto. All night, incendiary bombs rained on it, and fires broke out in many places. Houses came crashing down, and among their ruins were heard the cries of wounded men, women, and children. Many brave fighters perished among those ruins. In the morning, the ghetto stood in a sea of flames. The survivors, numbering some 30,000, began reorganizing for defense. The houses on the outskirts were vacated, and the arms taken to the center of the ghetto. Also, the food, which could still be saved, was taken away. Special squads of the fighters fortified themselves again in the remaining buildings. When the enemy again attacked in the morning, he was confronted by stiff and desperate resistance at every step, near every building. The battle lasted all day long, and the Germans had to fight for hours before capturing a single house, even if it was but a ruin. In the evening, the Germans managed to penetrate deeper into the ghetto and to capture a few of the taller buildings. After the night of inferno and the ensuing battles on the following morning, the leaders of the ghetto saw that the end was near, unless new methods of warfare could be devised. They tried to reach an understanding with the Polish underground, and suggested that the non-Jewish population of the city rise against the Germans, thus forcing the Germans to fight on both sides. But the Poles replied that the time had not yet come for a general uprising on their part. Under these circumstances, the fighters of the ghetto abandoned their defense tactics for acts of terror and revenge. Groups of fighters went out of the ghetto, attacking and killing German soldiers. The Jewish heroes fought the Germans until they themselves were killed. Others fled to the woods and joined the Polish guerrillas. Many perished on the road, fighting German soldiers. Many others surrendered to the Germans, having hand grenades hidden in their clothes, with which they later killed their guards, losing their own lives in the explosions. After a few more days of fighting, the Germans realized that they would have to contest every house in the ghetto. Every building now became an even more fortified stronghold. Whenever Germans appeared in front of a house, they were fired on from the windows, from the garrets, from the roof, until they managed to blow up the house and its heroic defenders perished in its ruins. In the last house were gathered all those who had survived and were still carrying on the fight. During the last few days, the situation was horrible. There was hardly any food left, and water could not be brought in because it was impossible to go out on the street. The Nazis committed terrible atrocities, bringing captured Jews and hanging them on the posts of the ghetto, and otherwise exceeding their own record for brutality in all the years of their occupation. On the 42nd day of the uprising, there was only one four-story building left in the center of the ghetto over which the blue and white flag waved. For eight hours, a battle raged over that house, 
and by midnight the Germans captured it. Every floor, every step was hotly contested. When all defenders at the gates fell, the Germans entered the building, encountering the fierce resistance of those on the ground floor. When the first floor was taken, the second floor was contested just as desperately, and so on from floor to floor. The blue and white banner held by a young Halutz was carried by the survivors from floor to floor. Late at night it fluttered from the top story, where a desperate struggle was still going on. When the shooting was over, a crash was heard. The young Halutz hurled himself down, wrapped in the blue and white flag, which he had guarded for forty-two days and nights. The flag was red with the blood of the martyr, the last fighter of the ghetto, who ended his life in this heroic manner. The next morning the Germans, triumphantly, announced that the ghetto of Warsaw no longer existed. Thousands of German soldiers paid for that victory with their lives. The heroes of the ghetto fought and died like saintly martyrs. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe.